conjures up bleak images of desperate soldiers trying to fight off starvation and hypothermia while simultaneously fighting the onslaught of a merciless and relentless enemy, regardless of which side they were on. It was, to put it mildly, a hellish and miserable existence, the likes of which few people in our modern times can even begin to understand. It was a battle of both enormous strategic and symbolic value, and one which is remembered in history due largely to its raw ferocity. To be sure, it was but one of many such battles which helped decide the fate of the war and the world to come. But today we focus on this one, this one epic tale of massive armies clashing head-on in the very heart of Europe. from December of 1944 through January of 1945 and was the last major German offensive against the Allies in World War II. The campaign itself was a last-ditch effort by Hitler to split the Allied forces in two, thus halting their drive towards Germany and destroying their ability to supply their constantly advancing armies. It was during this time that militarily Hitler's madness seemed to have gone beyond simple megalomania and entered the territory of sheer delusion. Erroneously believing that the alliance between France, Britain and the United States was inherently weak, it was his hope that all total victory on the Western Front would require would be one major attack for his enemies and their allies to crumble. So strong was this belief that Hitler, in an act he believed would tip the scales in Germany's favor, ordered a massive push against the Allied forces moving in from his west, consisting primarily of American forces, which in his mind were far too undisciplined and inexperienced to put up a successful defense against such a mighty war machine as he had created. The attack was first named the Ardennes Offensive, but due to the German incursion initially creating a notable bulge in the Allied front line, it later became more commonly and even notoriously known as the Battle of the Bulge. Hitler's central plan was to launch a massive onslaught upon the Allies using three different armies which would, in his mind at least, demoralize and destabilize the whole alliance while also securing the huge and strategically valuable port of Antwerp, through which a substantial portion of Allied supplies was being shipped. On December 16, 1944, the plan was put into action. Sepp Dietrich, the equivalent of a four-star general and a longtime associate of Hitler, having served both as Hitler's private chauffeur and bodyguard years earlier, was entrusted to lead the attack and secure Antwerp using the 6th Panzer Army Division. Dietrich had proven himself ruthlessly efficient and fiercely loyal to Hitler during the political purge of the Night of the Long Knives, traits that Hitler hoped would once again bring fortune on his side. The 5th Panzer Army, under the command of General Hasso von Manteuffel, was tasked with attacking the center of the American forces and securing the strategically important roads and railroads of St. Vith. His order stated that upon the defeat of the Americans, he was then to push onward and proceed directly to Brussels. General Eric Brandenburger and his 7th Army was to attack the southern flank and create a buffer zone protecting the 5th Panzer Army from American reinforcements. To hedge his bets, Hitler also assigned the 15th Army to be held in reserve to counter any unforeseen resistance or attacks by the Allies. The 
question ultimately was, however, would this be enough? Hitler, for his part, believed firmly that his forces would be able to both surround and cut off America's 1st and 9th armies as well as Britain's 2nd army and Canada's 1st army, all of whom were on the advance. It was an absurd plan to say the least, as since D-Day, Germany had been in relatively constant retreat, with its military running rapidly out of supplies while facing off against a combined might of the entire English-speaking world plus France, all the while also mired in fighting the Russians to their east. And as we know, the Russians had turned out to be a much more formidable enemy than Hitler ever thought though even many of his own strategists doubted the effectiveness of such an offensive, Hitler would hear none of it. So convinced was he that victory was at hand, even despite his failing lines and advancing enemies, that Hitler insisted upon going forward with the offensive, sure that it would turn the tides in his favor. Though impossible to know his exact state of mind or genuine thoughts on what the future held during these last days of the war, it's safe to assume that he was not accepting reality for what it was. This was followed then by a massive mechanized attack involving the majority of German forces based at Schnee Eiffel. Initially, Germany began by experiencing what seemed to be great success. The crazy plan, with all of its last stand feeling, appeared to be working. The question was, why? The answer is a series of fortunate circumstances that played out perfectly in Hitler's favor. To begin with, the weather at the time was perfect for the German objectives. Heavy fog and low clouds prevented the Allies from using the air superiority they had enjoyed since beginning their incursion into the continent. Fighter aircraft like the P-51 Mustang of the United States Army Air Force and the Spitfire of the Royal Air Force simply couldn't operate effectively in such conditions, obligating ground forces to do the majority of fighting. The cold temperatures also meant that the ground itself was solid enough to allow mechanized vehicles to easily traverse the otherwise notoriously muddy regions, thus making advance possible. This combination of factors played perfectly into Hitler's style of blitzkrieg warfare. Secondly though, the Germans had done their homework. Ahead of the attack, German spies with perfect accents dressed as American soldiers had been sent behind enemy lines engaging in sabotage, such as changing road signs, cutting telephone lines, and spreading misinformation wherever they could. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, the attack came as a complete surprise to the Allies who did not expect such an all-out assault to take place. As military strategists have pointed out since the dawn of time, the element of surprise is half the battle. As it would play out, however, there was a limit to how far good luck would take them in the face of such overwhelming odds. The success of the German advance on the Allies lasted just two days until the tide turned yet again. Despite punching the infamous bulge into the Allied front line, the Germans could not fully break through to capitalize on their advance. Having based their attack on the power of their mechanized divisions, the logistical nightmare of maintaining the supply of fuel needed to continue proved to be an impossible matter to tackle 
as the Germans quickly found they had neither the fuel nor the ability to transport such to maintain the pressure they had mounted. The farther they pushed against the Allied forces, the longer their supply lines became for whatever fuel they did manage to send, while at the same time forcing the Allied supply lines to shorten. Further complicating the German effort, by December 22nd the weather had begun to clear up, allowing the Allies to bring their superior air power once again into the fray. On the following day, December 23rd, the Americans launched a massive counterattack, smashing the advancing Germans hard as they struggled to maintain mobility. Germany did attempt to strike back on Christmas Eve, launching the world's first jet-powered bombing mission using 16 Me-262s in an attempt to disrupt Allied supply lines by destroying what was perceived as vital rail yards. What little success they did have was, however, meaningless, as German forces still didn't possess the necessary fuel to move their tanks or mechanized infantry any further forward. The 60 miles they had traversed in the first two days of the battle had, for all intents and purposes, depleted all their fuel resources, stranding many a German vehicles along the way. Stalled out as many were, there was no way forward, with the only way back being on foot at the height of winter. As a result, the fighting which followed was brutal and bitter, with the unusual cold winter taking it all from bad to worse for soldiers on both sides. Many fighting in the Ardennes died of simple exposure. On December 27th, General Patton famously smashed through the German lines and liberated Bastogne, where American soldiers had stubbornly held out behind enemy lines. By mid-January 1945, the lack of fuel was undeniable and the Germans were forced to simply abandon their vehicles and start walking. The once proud 1st SS Panzer Division, led by Lieutenant Colonel Joachim Piper, made their way back to Germany on foot and in shame, leaving all their much vaunted hardware behind. engagement American forces ever saw in World War II. 600,000 American servicemen were involved and around 75,000 were lost while the German casualty toll reached a staggering 100,000 men. Historians have often asked if there was even the slightest chance that the Germans could have won this battle. In a word, no. Their efforts were doomed from the start due to their lack of fuel and air power. At his trial, Field Marshal von Brunstedt remarked that absolutely all conditions for the possible success of such an offensive were lacking. General von Millington added, a large-scale offensive has no hope of success against an enemy who enjoys supreme command of the air. But perhaps most importantly, the seeds of failure were sown even earlier with Hitler's unreasonable belief that attacking the Allies would break the alliance. Whether it was hubris, madness, or merely a misapprehension of the nature of humans under pressure, many agreed that it was Hitler and his mindset that ultimately proved to be the Allies' greatest advantage. For as history has shown time after time, a group under attack comes together, not apart. Thank you for watching.